Welcome back to another weekly GMBN Tech Show. Coming up on this week's show, there's a brand new Kotic bike in a couple of really cool colorways. Yeti go a bit green. Commercial have got something pretty cool to show off and we're gonna have a little bit of a quiz as well. Okay, so straight into the news and well, first up, got to talk about Yeti, clearly. Uh, Yeti have gone green. Not as you might think though. Yeti, of course, are very famous for this sort of color. Uh, this is the famous Yeti blue or the Yeti turquoise color. Um, really, in a lot of people's opinions, it's not Yeti if it's not this color, but they have been experimenting with different colors over the last few years. We've seen a lot of their black bikes out. We've seen some gunmetal grays. We've even seen the bright orange before, but this, is the new green color. Now check it out on screen. This looks amazing. It's just verdi green. And now just a reminder of the spec because it's not a new bike, but it has got a few really cool things that make it particularly relevant. So it's a 150 mil travel bike. It's 29 inch wheel specific. It uses that switch infinity system, which this is it up close. Really cool system actually. So if you're unfamiliar with this, it essentially allows that main pivot point to move slightly up and down. I think it's only about four mil each way. Uh, it's a very small amount, but that makes a massive difference to what the actual pivot point does. So to start with, it allows a slightly rearward axle path. But of course, with a rearward axle path, you get chain growth. So before it starts growing too much, it moves back down again, which basically shortens it. So effectively, you get all the best traits of a bike over the small bump sensitivity, the initial breakaway over those bump impacts, the ones that don't want to, well, the ones that kind of want to hook your bike up a little bit, but you don't get any of the negativity of having extreme chain growth. As an upside, really, something else that's quite cool about it, it's got quite a high anti-squat value, so it pedals extremely well. Next up in news is the fourth generation of the Kotic Rocket. So the Sheffield based bike company is still making their bikes out of steel and they're really, really nice. Uh, this is one of them on screen in the sunny yellow color. The other colorway is the gloss metal, which looks a little bit, I guess you'd say like a gun metal gray. Really nice looking frames. There's a load of details floating around, uh, cat hair randomly as well and the like there. A uh, load of details on the screen right now. So it's 165 mil rear travel. Uh, it's got a lower leverage ratio now. So it's got revised kin kinematics. It's plusher than it's ever been. A bit more planted, a bit better on that smaller bump sensitivity that everyone really is trying to get from their bikes. Uh, it's got revised geometry and it's got a steeper seat angle on there and a slacker head angle. Now, depending on what fork you run, whether you run it on a 160 or a 170, it's got 64 and a half or 64 degree head angles so that's pretty slack if you think you go back what 10 years you're talking more like 68 degrees head angle so losing four degrees over years is quite a lot now Kotic actually provide their seat angle measurement as an actual measurement a certain distance from the ground which kind of makes sense because the higher you have your saddle effectively the slacker it could actually be uh, so you're hovering just around the 75 degree mark there and there's four sizes available the small medium large and extra large uh, the reach on a large so one of the more common sizes is a 48 five and if you look on screen now you can see quite a few more cool images of those bikes um, i especially like the fact that the extra large bikes they're coming at 515 so it's quite a familiar length for me uh, nice big nice roomy bikes but by all means it doesn't mean the things are biased these things are lightning fast there's a little video clip on screen from the kotic bikes vimeo page um, look at the thing railing doesn't that make you want to hit the trails now man I'm gutted that we can't ride look at this stuff just makes me want to ride so much uh, complete bikes that retail from 3199 us pounds us pounds us pounds uh, and they've got the love it or give your money back guarantee so um if you're unsure and you obviously can't demo a bike at the moment you fancy buying one you can buy one of these and if you don't like it you can send it back for your money back uh, pretty good bowl accounts uh, next up in news is Commercial Meta AM29. Now these are actually the team bikes. So there's a little gallery going on screen here. I'm just gonna read out some of the spec of the bike. So it's the Meta AM29 frame, which we know. It's running the RockShox Lyric Ultimate Fork, 170 mil travel, uh, widely regarded as one of the very best enduro forks there's ever been. Everyone that's ridden it says it is incredibly supple, really supportive, and when you stick it into the rock gardens really hard, you'll come out the other side. This thing eats that stuff up for breakfast. Kind of apt really, seeing as they're called rock shocks, hey? Um, Outback is running a super deluxe ultimate shock. Uh, SRAM XX Eagle uh, access transmission on there, which is really cool. Now, something that is quite interesting, they're not running code brakes. Now, I would have thought being an enduro race bike, they'd be running codes, but they're running the G2 brakes on there. Um, of course, a GT Ultimate, so the top end spec, but we know that they're plenty powerful. We've ridden them before ourselves. We know all about those brakes. 
Um, but you do see a lot of those riders running um, the full-on downhill brake, the code. But uh, that says a lot, I think, about how good that G2 brake is. Now, interestingly, the wheel set, they're running the spank wheels with the VibroCore rims. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with VibroCore. Essentially, it's got a foam on the inside of the rims. Uh, this actually comes from a motocross world. We've seen it on the inside of handlebars before. Spank have done bars with it as such. And the foam essentially uh, stops that bar having that sort of jarring feeling, uh, stops them vibrating, the sort of resonance you could get through them uh, by having a foam on the inside. Now, it's not the same as just filling your handlebars up, expanding foam, it's a damping foam. Um, I'd imagine something a bit more along the lines sort of soundproof foam but um very cool stuff nonetheless i've never ridden them if anyone's out there has uh, let us know do they work interesting stuff i think um Renthal apex stem 40 mil there a fat bar at 780s uh reverb access a fabric scoop saddle crank brothers pedals e13 chain guard man just ripping with all the stuff fully decked out um yeah well there you go that, that was news Okay, let's have a little bit of a quiz now, just for a bit of fun. I'm gonna ask you three questions now. Now, I want you to see if you know these off the top of your head. No looking on your phones, no looking on your computers and that. Uh, just interesting to see who knows what. I mean, you might be able to turn this into something or a bit more of a regular feature, a bit of general trivia. Uh, good stuff to know down the pub, good stuff to know when you're out on your bikes with your mates. So, first question. There's three questions, we're gonna pick up the answers a bit later. Let me show you the first one. What does SPD stand for? Okay, second question. What is this? What's it called? Who is it named after? And for a bonus point, what's the name of the guy that made them? And finally, the last question is a bit more of a tech question. Which way would you loosen your left pedal? Now, instead of doing the regular bike cave and top mods, I actually posted something on my Instagram over the weekend and also on the GMBN Tech Instagram, asking for anyone else that's working on bikes at home to send in some photos or clips and just tell us what you're up to in this isolation period. I've got a few great entries now, but please make sure if you're working on your bike at home or you're doing something cool in this isolation period, let us know about it. Take some cool video clips on your phone. That's all you need to do, 20 seconds, bit of selfie action to your phone and then buzz it over to us. The address is at the bottom of the screen here and we'd love to feature you on the show. So just give us a shout out and we'll give you a shout out back. So first up this week, this one's from a guy called Will Fripp. I know Will quite well actually. Now he's been using his time to completely strip down his bike. So on screen, you'll see a few shots here. So he's been basically moving his uh, Specialized turbo lever over from SRAM to Shimano, a full service stripped down post winter cleanup, and even respraying some of the bits hit hardest by the winter wet. Wow, that's dedication that is. So, see, he's done the saddle rails, of course, your saddle rails when you've got like a dirt and muck on your shorts, you rub them off on the side there and you lose a bit of paint. In fact, you've probably seen a lot of my bikes in shots. So, that's actually a really good idea, Will. I've not actually bothered to do that ever. But uh, transmission looks spanking clean. You must have spent a long time doing this. I actually can't believe how clean your bike is. And there you go, there's the sort of the flat lay of all your stuff. Nice to see you've got that KMC chain as well. So that's the e-bike specific chain. So that's got bigger pins. Kind of curious about those just in general as a, as a regular chain. I might have to get one just to have a look at. Nice to see you going for Shimano. I mean, always there's uh, plenty of options out there for people, which Shimano and SRAM tend to be the bigger players. Out of interest, what made you go to Shimano from SRAM? Was it just a change or something you didn't like or something luring you over to Shimano? Uh, definitely interested to know that. Because you're riding an e-bike, I suspect that's something to do with it. Um, let us know if you can in those comments. That would be great. Okay, next up is from Chris Longbone. So Chris is over at Retro Bike. So those guys make some of the coolest retro content. We're gonna put a link actually to Retro Bike in the comments underneath this video. Uh, I'm just gonna leave you with, with Chris for a second. Hi, a little video here to show you what I've been doing this weekend and what I'll probably be doing for the next few weeks um, with us being in lockdown. Um, as you can see, I've got a couple of bikes that I maintain, look after, uh, I ride them all, show them all, etc. etc. So uh, keeping top side of them is important. Um, one of the ways I do this is with the help of these. I'm not going to show you exactly what I've been doing, but a good way of monitoring how you, what you've been doing is to have like laminated sheets. You can either post it if that's easier. Just write down uh, what jobs need doing on each particular bike. So on this pink pace I've just bought, finish building the wheels. Um, nearly finished. Just got to tighten the spokes up, make sure it's all tensioned up. Um, 
you know, put air in the forks, such as like. So that's that's you know, bike that's going to get built. Um, I have one of them. Also have for bikes that I ride fairly regular um, sheets for maintenance. So you know, replace the chain and cassette. Um, just a good way you can hang these from your rafters, um, joists, or whatever else you've got in your garage. Just so you can maintain it and just screw them off. So you know, put loop, done it all, easy. Yeah, hope that helps. Um, take care, stay safe. See you all at the Melvins. Cheers, Chris. So uh, always nice to see what you're up to. And look at the amount of bikes behind you, dude. Oh my God. Um, I think you could do with seeing some of those a bit more. How about you uh, wheel some of those out, take some photos of those in your garden and send them in to rewind for us. Love to see them. Cheers, guys. Love retro bikers. I love what you guys are doing. Next up is from a friend of mine, actually, Mike Sanderson. I just thought I'd do a nice thing and I built my mate Lee, my mate Lee a pump track bike as he's been coming with me on his high tower long travel and really struggling. So I built him hashtag Minga2. <laughs> it's not the first bike I've built out of spare parts. To be fair, I think it looks pretty good. Now in the first picture that you can see on the screen now, there's a big white line, uh, white squiggly line drawn around the seat mast. And that is the key. So you've hacked that off uh, with a hacksaw, I'm, I'm guessing, and turned it into like a mate do jump bike. Dude, it looks amazing. Loving the tan wheels on there as well. Look how low slung it looks. Just a difference by taking that seat mast off. Obviously, if you're gonna do this on your own bikes home, it will invalidate any warranty you've got. But I don't think it's that minging. I think, dare I say, I think it looks better than it did to start with. Fair play, Mike, that's a great one to, and great time as well to um, build up a bike for your friend at a time like this. That's ideal, and that's good use of spare parts. Wow. Okay, next up is from Will over at Revolution Mobile Bike Workshop in Bristol. Here's Will. Hi, Doddy, Will from the Revolution Workshop in Bristol, just down the road from your offices. Just letting you know what we're doing in self-isolation. Uh, I actually operate a, a mobile service anyway, so, um, this isn't really that different for me. The main difference is, is that rather than fixing bikes at people's address or place of work, uh, I'm taking everything home, uh, doing it in my makeshift workshop for the time being. Uh, the, the, the kind of the, the bikes that I'm servicing have changed quite a bit uh, over the course of the winter. I've mostly been servicing uh, commuter bikes you know, V-brake hybrids, that kind of thing. Uh, everything's changed now. The, weather, the, the weather's got a lot better and everybody's been given an hour to go and have their constitutional uh, hours of exercise. So I'm seeing a lot more uh, leisure bikes. That said, today I've got a retro Kona in the stand, a cinder cone, I'm guessing from the early noughties because it's got a set of STXRC cranks from back in the day. Uh, this one's just in to have some brake uh, brake and gear cables, uh, new brake pads, and a new chain. Um, this, like I say, it's an NHS staff workers' bikes. So this is taking priority over anything else. But like I say, at the moment, most of the bikes I'm seeing are recreational bikes. So I'm seeing road bikes. I'm seeing I've got a nice pivot carbon full suspension. I think it's a six point something like that um, in the workshop. That's uh, in the shed, sorry, but waiting to be worked on. That one's going in the stand next after this. Uh, like I say, at the moment, priority, I've got to give it to NHS staff. I've got to give it to key workers to get to work on because, you know, that's the reason we've been given this sort of key worker status to stay open. So, uh, yeah, I've got, to get, I've got to give those guys priority first. But, yeah, um, nice bit of retro, retro tech for you there. Um, what's changing about the way that we're doing things? Like I say... Everything's been done here instead of at the customer's address. Um, using face masks, using nitrile gloves, uh, not just for working on the bikes, but for actually picking them up and dropping them off. And then I'm spraying down the bikes with um, alcohol brake cleaner, which is pretty powerful um, disinfectant. Um, so the whole bike gets sprayed down with that when I drop it off. Um, and I'm also... Um, will will The customers will leave their bikes in... Uh, locked up somewhere with a key hidden somewhere safe or they'll give me the code to the lock if it's a combination lock so uh, we can minimise contact as much as possible or they're just leaving the garage open for me or something like that. Um, so a lot of trust and it's, you know, it's really nice that people give us that, that level of trust to just come and take their bike away or leave it locked up for us. But yeah, it's just a very strange environment and, and way, to, way to be doing business at the moment. Anyway, uh, loving the channel. Keep it up. Cheers. 
That's really good to hear, Will. Thank you for that entry. Uh, Will's also a friend of GMBN. We know him locally. And really good that he's actually repairing people's bikes that really need to be repaired. And kind of interesting how you're making things work. So uh, good luck, and I hope you continue through these awkward times. Okay, and now this one's a really cool one. Gonna leave you with this one. So this is from Richard. Um, it doesn't say where he is, but it's, he's basically stripped down his Rose Pikes Peak. Uh, on the screen now, you can see a bit of a time lapse. So he's quite into his suspension. He says the suspension out back is okay and perfectly usable, but my background is race prepping and motorbikes and I can't help but fettle. So he's adjusted the, uh, the straight stack to a tapered stack to improve the low speed to high speed transition. Uh, when loaded on the fork, it felt like it had little support, but any increase in air pressure made the fork feel harsh on small bumps. Yeah, I get that. So he's tried tokens and you've re, re shimmed that, shimmed the mid valve to reduce compression and rebound at low speed. Wow, I'll tell you what, that's awesome. Um, hey, let's see a video on a bit more of that detail. I love what you've done in that, and I know Henry will be well into that as well. Wicked, thanks for sending that one in, Rich. Okay, and the last one is just a good old-fashioned bike cave. So, I've got a day off due to lockdown, so I decided to build a bike cave in my section garage. I couldn't go out and get materials, so I upcycled as much as possible, including an old suitcase. <laughs> well, that's good. Uh, so they're like some loft chipboard, um, climbing board sort of thing, or storage boards on the wall. That's good work. Yeah, we've got a kitchen cupboard unit on the wall by the looks of it there. Awesome. The suitcase, that is genius. That is actually genius. What a great idea. So you can close it up and get it all out of the way and it gives you a little working surface. Dude, that's amazing. That is a proper good, I'm gonna send that over to Martin for hacks and bodges. That is definitely a hack. You've made something better there. Nice cheeky nuke proof under there. I'm loving the bar ends on the wall as well. I think there's a lot of people, that's the best thing bar ends are for. Unless of course you're building a retro bike. Uh, really cool to see. I'm blown away by that suitcase. That is a genius bodge. I said hack a minute ago. It's a bodge, but it's also a hack. And I like that you like teacup too. As a lot of the people in the world are in isolation, of course, we are too here at GMBN, EMBN and GMBN Tech. We're all doing our bit. We're all working from home. I hope that you guys all are as well. But let us know what you're up to. It doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing. All right, you can't get out and go on those massive rides that you usually love to do. But why not make the most of that? Get your bike cave sorted out. Sort all those little niggling things out on your bike, that creak maybe that it had. And please take some videos. We want to see some video footage of all of you guys. So do something on your phone, on your GoPro, on your posh video camera, whatever you have, even on a webcam. Anything will do and send it in to us. Once more, the link is at the bottom of the screen there. Cheers, guys. Okay, now back to the quiz and I'll give you some answers now. So the first question was, what does SPD stand for? Now it stands for Shimano Pedaling Dynamics. That's right, the SPD pedal. The original mountain bike clipless pedal and they named it Shimano Pedaling Dynamics. Well, firstly, because they designed it. Uh, but more importantly, it was the first pedal that had a proper recessed cleat. Prior to that, they were all like this pedal on the screen, uh, kind of like a roadie style pedal with a huge cleat on the bottom. No doubt amazing on the bike for pedaling efficiency and all the other stuff. But horrendous off the bike. Have you ever seen a roadie walk in a pair of shoes like that? Like a duck with a limp, absolutely ridiculous. So Shimano took it on themselves to design from the ground up a whole range of shoes and a range of pedals and a brand new cleat design. The cleat is recessed on your shoe, which at first people laughed at because they thought they were gonna get bunged up with mud. And they kind of do to a degree, but they can push it through. You can always locate on these. And of course, over the years, we've seen many other people come up with different systems, but the SPD was the original fella there. Next one is, what was this? Anyone get it? Come on, a few of you must have got it, yeah? It's a DCD, and that stands for Dave's Chain Device. It was named after Dave Hemming, who was the Britain's first medalist at the Mountain Bike World Champs in 1990 in Durango, uh, USA, uh, Colorado, I think Durango is. Uh, he got a silver medal, and I think he was like 17 at the time, and he's uh, quite fresh and young. And he needed a way to keep the chain on his bike, so to increase the chain tension and wrap it around those chain rings a bit more to help stop the chain jumping off. His friend and a sponsor, I believe at the time, Pete Tompkins, designed him one of these, and it's got a Delrin roller on them, two pinch bolts to hold it onto the chain state of the bike, and it had a cool little buzz noise that it made. So a few of you might remember these from back in the day, but this one actually was one of the first ones before it had a logo stamped in it that Pete had painted himself, which um, I'm really actually quite glad he gave me that. So nice little keepsake. And the last one, which is actually a good bit of bike trivia for you, is which way does a left hand pedal undo from the bike? And the answer is clockwise. So it's not always 
anti-clockwise, as you might think for a loosening bolt. Think about why. The reason why is if it was anti-clockwise, you risk undoing it as you're pedaling. By having it loosening clockwise, that's the opposite to the way it revolves. It also means there's a real easy way to remember which way your pedals undo from the bike. And the answer for both of them is you undo to the back of the bike. So that's anti-clockwise for your drive side pedal and clockwise for the non-drive side pedal. Pretty easy to remember that and hopefully it'll avoid you knocking your knuckles in future. Uh, if you like the quiz kind of concept and idea, let us know. Uh, there's plenty of questions. We can do a full on quiz. We might be able to do an interactive one. We don't know. Maybe we'll have a live one day and we can do it like that. Um, let's take it up soon. Okay, now it's time for Rewind. This is the retro bit of the show where we get to talk about where all the cool stuff now came from. Had to start somewhere. Some of it you might laugh at. Some of it you might think, well, how on earth? Were they making things like that? Like those climb bikes that I showed you on the video at the weekend? Astonishing, they were so far ahead of their time. And even by today's standards, they look pretty good. If you've got anything old, anything retro, let us know about it. We honestly love to see this stuff. So uh, upload the link is at the bottom here. It's also in the description in the comments underneath. So fire away and let us know and we'll put it on the show. So first up this week, really pleased to see this, was this monstrosity of a bike. So this is a Trek 9000. Uh, the picture's from Arif, and he says, uh, this is in my local Trek bike shop in Canberra. Um, I found this in my local shop. I believe it's similar to one that Neil rode in the video. Absolutely right. I forgot that Neil bought one of these for a video. So as a high pivot, it had something, something resembling a pile of rubber donuts instead of a shock on it. Um, extreme loads of pedal feedback on the thing it would actually jack up loads of anti-squat on this um almost like trying to ride a pair of scissors the whole thing would be like this as you're riding down the road horrendous but kind of cool at the same time in fact i remember a really rad shot in mbi magazine of jay hardy i reckon you might be watching this jay uh, of you fully crossed up flat sideways on one of these things um i'd love to see the state of the bike when you landed from that jump because they were bendy out back but really cool to see them Really nice, amazing condition. So also note it's got the Trek own brand bar ends on there and cockpit and also the fork. I believe they worked in collaboration with Showa to make those forks. Uh, obviously they were Trek branded to, to be on the bikes. Uh, but it's, it's kind of really nice. I mean, it's disgusting in it to be fair, but it's kind of quite cool. I love that Trek tried so many things over the years. Uh, next one is from Callion, and this is a Hot Chili Rampage. Wow, so all the way out of Bulgaria. Uh, so this is my retro bike, a Hot Chili Rampage frame, uh, Bergman the Beast Fork, 24 inch front wheel with a three inch tire and a 26 inch rear. Wow, that's like um, a reverse mullet. Never seen that before. Imagine having long hair at the front and a uh, skinhead on the back. That'd be weird, wouldn't it? Now that's exactly what this is. E13 chain guide. Uh, Tioga Nicholas Vulo edition saddle. So that was a race version of that saddle. It was a lot thinner on the back there. It had the Kevlar shoulders on, so when you crashed, you didn't tear your saddle. Uh, Club Roost Go Fast bars with the clamp on them. It looks like an Azonic shorty stem as well. Ironic, they were called a shorty stem, but look at the thing. It's like a tiller on a sailing boat, isn't it? But uh, <laughs> really cool to see. In fact, I said they're Club Roost Go Fast bars. They're not. They're, they're lead tech. I wonder if they like were made of lead or something. But um, they look just like the Club Roost ones, except the brace on them. Oh my God. It's horrendous. It's like a bit of scaffolding. But, uh, pretty crazy to see what happened back then, isn't it? And look at those forks. Wow, Bergman's big upside down inverted forks, or if you're in a motocross or motorbikes, the correct way up, um, because you guys always have inverted forks. A bit harder to do that on a mountain bike though, and make them work as well without having them either too heavy or too flexy, so fine line there. Man, it's a kind of cool looking bike, isn't it? Nice low pivot. I bet the back end felt pretty good on it considering, but um, look how high that BB is. That thing would have suffered. Kind of cool though, quite forward thinking, the fact you've got a three inch tire with 24 inch wheel. So I guess that's fairly similar to a 26 inch rear wheel with maybe a 2.2. So not far different. Cool to see. Oh, look at this, wow. So this one's from Michael. This is a 90s Norco Kokanee. Named after the Kokanee beer? Or is the beer named after the bike? Or is it named after something else that I'm not aware of? Don't know, only remember drinking Kokanee when I've been at Whistler before. Either way, look at this thing. Wow, so you've turned it into a 1x7 setup, so it's not fully original. It's like an LA, oh no, it's a 200GS rear mech on there, maybe a 300. Brooks saddle on the back there. Oh man, so nice. U brake. Wow, really cool. Hey, a weird story here that someone told me from, uh, I think it might have been Cannings over at GCN. So the Brooks saddle, 
they're made of proper uh, cowhide leather. Now, back in the day before, you used to have dedicated products to break the leather in. Apparently, when they first started doing them, you used to piss on them, <laughs> um, if you can imagine. Apparently, ammonia in your wee basically helps soften the leather. I'm guessing you would clean it before riding it, but apparently that's how it used to be done way back in the day. Uh, call me out if that's wrong, but someone told me that. They might have just been winding me up to see if I tell that stupid story, but um, I'm pretty sure that that's right. And if it's not, you can blame John Cannings because he told me that. Okay, and last up is this, well, actually this is the bike cave entrance, but I've just seen what is in the next picture. So this is from Paul in Texas, USA my personal tinker town. I love coming out and tweaking things and adjusting every sweet spot on the bike, all this sort of stuff. Right, let's just get to it. Look at your workspace. Nice red bench, decent vice. Loving the uh, pegboard at the back. You've got a gold chain ring hanging up on the left, just like I have. I've got a gold chain ring over there. In fact, it looks like the same one. It's uh, yeah, interesting, nice. But more importantly, look at some of these old bikes. So you've got Gary Fisher down at the back there. I'm very lucky enough to have met Gary a few times. Absolute legend of the sport. Look at a Cannondale Super V at the back there. Wow, and you've got some IRC tires. I tell you what, like I love a tan wall, but IRC, had, they were so dark, the side of them, it's more like a red color. They looked amazing. And there we go, another Gary Fisher there, so that's a Joshua. So the Gary Fisher Joshua was, um, I guess the Fisher equivalent of the Trek Y22. So you might see me ride that bike in a Shimano video a while back, where I was running original XTR versus the modern XTR, and I borrowed a bike, which was a Trek Y22, the carbon version of one of these, essentially. Uh, pretty crazy unified design, so it didn't really work when you were stood up, and it worked really well when you sat down, which is kind of what people wanted back then, which I'll never understand, but, um, but nonetheless, they sold loads of them. Now look at this. Oh, Cannondale S600, looking like a bit of a street monster set up single speed. Really cool to see you're still running that. And it's got the fatty bladed fork on there with the head shock up front. Very nice. Oh, and look at that, a Super V2000. Oh man, I always wanted a red, I think it was a Super V700, probably the cheapest one you could get. I always wanted one when I was young. I never got around to getting one. Maybe. Maybe I need to get one. Like I know I've got the, the amp down there winking at me to build it up, but maybe I need to get one of those Cannondales as well. I might be able to pick one up fairly cheap. It's got the Fox Alps 5 shock on the back, the head shock. Such a weird looking bike design. I don't know why I ever desired it. I think they're kind of ugly, but amazing at the same time. A big boom down tube on them with that seat mask suspended by the spindly little seat stays. I guess you could call them seat stays. And there's that Fisher again. But then you look at the Cannondale in that picture, it looks amazing. They're weird looking bikes, that's for sure. And you've got the Coda cranks on there as well. Super cool. And then you even got a price tag on it. 2,995 US dollars. Wow. Uh, 1997 is the date. Dude, that is fantastic. Thank you for sending those in. Absolutely love all these little memory, memory lane trips. Awesome stuff. Thanks again. And the last thing in Rewind, actually, I forgot to mention, gotta give a big shout out to Steve Pete uh, for this one. His film, Won't Back Down, is now up on Vimeo, so you can watch it for free. Uh, what perfect timing to have such an amazing documentary out there. Of course, it finishes with Steve Pete becoming world champion and where he's gonna progress from there, which obviously, that happened a few years back now, but obviously it starts with PT way back in the day, so there's loads of old school footage of PT on old Kona bikes with a little 1.5 inch specialized hard tires on there. I think it was running an explosive back in the uh, bat days. I think it's Baton All-Terrain Squad. Really, really great video, honestly. Well worth spending the time to sit down and watch it. In fact, I haven't seen it for a while. I might sit down and watch it. And it makes many a grown man weep as well. Some really emotional stuff in there. Absolutely fantastic. Now, of course, everyone is staying safe during this isolation period. Uh, we're gonna be making more content. I'll be continuing the weekly shows, continuing with the asks. I want to start making some different content. Now, bearing in mind, the self-shooting stuff can be quite tricky. So, I'm thinking about a bit more of a vloggy style approach. I actually need to do a few jobs on some of my bikes. I thought I may as well just film that. We're going to turn them into videos. I've got to overhaul a set of pedals, so I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that on a desktop. I'm going to film that and see how that one goes down. But if there's any other sort of maintenance stuff that you think I could be making from here, or Henry could be making from his garage, let us know, and we'll try and make those videos for you. Be patient with us. We're doing our best here to try and keep all the channels firing. Uh, we're all in contact with each other the whole time on Google Hangouts every day. So you are part of our channel, so we need your help. If you've got a great idea for us to make, 
let us know in those comments. And in the meantime, thank you so much for hanging around. It's so appreciated. There's a couple of videos for you. See you later.